Uh, so we are, uh, I guess we're not really a picture here, we're kind of off to the bottom here, but this is our uh, Diablo Can Fire Department. So we maintain a fire brigade on site at all times. Uh, so they have a pretty nice facility here. The uh, the fire captain for this uh, fire station said it's the nicest fire station he's ever been in in his <laughs> 35 years of uh, being a firefighter. So uh, they uh, have a couple, two fire trucks and another support vehicle. Uh, we also, down uh, a little bit further where that roll up door is, we keep emergency equipment here. So um, if you're familiar at all with uh, Fukushima and what happened there, they, uh, they became inundated by a tsunami. So all their equipment that was on site became flooded and unusable. Uh, so that was an eye-opening event for the industry. And so a lot of the equipment that we would need to operate the plant, if we had a similar event like that, we keep stored in there. So pumps, light trees, piping. If we lost all power completely, we could take equipment from there. We could throw hoses into the ocean and pump water out of the ocean and cool the plant that way. Uh, so there's that. Uh, we have fitness for duty over there, which is drug testing. Everybody that works out here uh, has to be under a mandatory drug testing program. So that's that for this area here. So you can see the desalination facility is located down here. Uh, so you can see it across where that green building is. Uh, it's not very big. It only produces about 550 gallons a minute of fresh water, which is a really small desalination facility. There's some facilities produce like 50 million gallons a day. Uh, so we're pretty small. The Diablo Canyon Marina, we have the, uh, the west and east breakwater. Uh, there is a plan during decommissioning to remove that breakwater. Uh, we worked really closely with some local leaders and actually Cal Poly was really interested in maintaining that breakwater. Uh, it also represented about, uh, I think it was going to be $350 million to remove and it was a million cubic yards of concrete that would have all had to have been hauled out of California uh, due to some weird legal rules. Uh, so it's actually more concrete in the breakwater and everything else combined. Wow. Yeah, that's a, 50, wow. Yeah, it, it, that's a 50,000 trips. Wow. That's a crazy factoid. There's a lot of concrete you can't see because it's like an iceberg. So there's material that kind of goes underneath. The, yeah, it's like it spreads out along the seafloor. Uh, so, and it's mostly riprap or is it like a poured foundation? So kind of thing? it's a riprap uh, breakwater that has these tri bar yeah. concrete okay. blocks on okay. top. And we'll go down there and we can see them. Okay. So they're. There was a, a wave event in the early 80s that actually destroyed this piece of the breakwater, just completely vanished into the ocean. Um, they used to use these 22 ton tri bar blocks that were what got obliterated. Okay. And then they replaced them with 37 ton blocks. <laughs> and then they put this concrete cap on the top of it and then grouted the whole thing together. <laughs> so what's really cool about that, if you're an entity that's thinking about taking over that breakwater to use, breakwaters are expensive. Like Avila Beach right now, the Port San Luis Harbor District, every couple of years they've got to go through, they will replace riprap, they have to do a lot of maintenance. It's super, super expensive, dangerous, really dangerous work. We have not spent a dollar on maintenance for this breakwater since 1983. Uh, so that's a free... That happens all the time. Uh, there there may be some alarms. <laughs> yeah. That is going to happen a lot. So, okay. so, uh, so we have our intake facility is located here. So this is where we actually uh, take up the seawater. Uh, the, the pipes are enormous. So it, it's 2 billion gallons of seawater a day. But even though it sounds like a lot, it's actually such a large volume, but a large diameter pipe that there's no this doesn't seem like there's any flow. So fish swim in, they swim out, nothing gets trapped. The only thing that's along for the ride is uh, like larva and, and things like that. They, they can make it through these traveling screens that we have here that filter out anything that's uh, larger than three eighths of an inch. So anything smaller than three eighths of an inch is along for the ride, uh, goes up in here into the cooling system and then comes out the, the discharge over there. Uh, the maintenance training building. And it's once through. It is once through, right. yes, correct. Maintenance training building and simulator building. This building was a result of the Three Mile Island incident. So Three Mile Island uh, is a power plant in New York that had a partial meltdown. What they found during that incident was that um, they did not have a exact mock-up of the control room that to train on that they had at the power plant. So something that might have been a switch was like a button. And then, you know, so people are looking for switches, right? And they're, they're spending lots of time trying to figure out where stuff is. 
but they shouldn't be doing that. They should be solving the problem. So in the, after that incident, our first coastal development permit that we had to procure for this facility was to build this simulator building because the rest of the facility, the power plant itself and some of these other buildings predate the Coastal Act and CEQA. This was built in 1968. Uh, staff office buildings down in the parking lot where we'll park. Uh, this warehouse, bigger than our Costco. So we don't have a lot of large buildings in this area. So it's one of the biggest buildings in the county. Uh, we have to keep spare parts on site, right? We can't go to Home Depot and get some of this stuff. Uh, so seals and pumps and different things that we need, might need in an emergency, or if we have an equipment that uh, break down and there's a, you know, we don't want to have to power down because the, you know we're in the middle of summer or something like that. We keep those spare parts there. Uh, we have our own machine shop, so anything that we need to make on site, really anything we can make in that machine shop. Uh, security building, we won't be going, well, we won't be going in any of these buildings here. This is our security building where we go through access, so every single person that comes through here has to have a background check. Uh, we go through explosive detectors, metal detectors, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the turbine building, uh, this is actually where the power is produced. Uh, it's 10% of the state's power, two turbines, uh, provides enough power for about 3 million homes. Uh, unit 2 containment up in the front, unit 1 containment in the back. This is where the reactor vessels themselves are housed. So everything is within a containment building. So if there was a release of some contaminated water, it's all within these pressurized vessels so nothing can come out of there. Uh, this fuel handling building, which is this rectangular building in the back, we store our new fuel. So when we have to refuel the reactor, we store that fuel in here along with some with the fuel that's been used in the reactor. Uh, once it's been in the reactor, it spends about seven, or, seven to 10 years in a pool to cool down before we put it in our dry cast storage, which we'll see later, it's up on the hill. Any questions about anything on here? Or? So what, what year was the, the construction started? 68? 1968 was the great initial grading. And then when was when did power first produce, be produced? Uh, it was commercial, commercial operation started in 1985. I have it in the slide okay. deck. Okay. I don't remember okay, the cool. exact date. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, but yeah, there was a series, I mean, we'll talk about it later, but there was a series of things that kind of delayed the right. opening Three Mile Island and some other stuff. Uh, the discovery of the Hosgery Fault, you know, initially we thought that the San Andreas Fault was the closest fault, so that was our controlling fault for our seismic uh, calculations. We actually found that there's a, a fault off three miles offshore that's uh, a lot closer, so that was our controlling fault. We need to make some redesign there. Um, yeah, and then we have this northern property here. Um, probably something I didn't mention. Uh, I mentioned it to the people that were in my van, but for the people in the other car, uh, the southern property is not, it's owned by a PG&E subsidiary uh, because it was initially a Spanish land grant. So it was a uh, um, like Rancho y San Miguelito uh, land grant. It was acquired by an Italian immigrant family. They were ranchers, the Marais, uh, and then a complicated history, but they ended up defaulting on their taxes in the late 80s, early 90s, and then PG&E acquired the property through a tax auction. So huh. They didn't want to have someone like the Sierra Club buy it and lock us out. Um, so we didn't want a hostile landlord, so PG&E mm -hmm. purchased that property, uh, and then, and actually the, one of the crazy bits about it is we, we didn't own this property when we built the power plant. So, you know, several billion dollar power, power plant on <laughs> lease property, wow. uh, in hindsight, it seems kind of insane, but anyways, here, here we ended up with the property anyway, so here we are. Any questions about anything?